being part of it. But rather than the normal welcome statement that you would expect at this time, I would like to take a few moments to tell you what I know. Friday morning to tell them of his decision. <clears throat> that Friday morning, Jack Felton, who under our bylaws automatically becomes president, became president at Tony's resignation, asked me if I would be agreeable to becoming an interim acting president or an acting interim president to allow him time to gear up for his presidency. Along the way, in various conversations, other directors had suggested that that might be an agreeable solution because I had genuine doubt for a variety of reasons that I was the right person to begin the healing process, which inevitably must take place in PRSA. Willing because I knew from personal experience that Jack needed time to prepare his team for his year as president. Second, I knew that Jack had the complete support he needed from his company for 1987, but knew he would have to get an okay, whatever okay was necessary, to uh, add additional time in 1986 to his commitment. Third, being semi-retired, at least that's what I think I am, and carrying a light client load at H&K, I was more easily available than others might be. And fourth, well, uh, what the hell, with the exception of a few harrowing experiences, I genuinely enjoy what I have done in behalf of PRSA. Bob Dylan Schneider and others at Hill and Knowlton gave me a complete green light to accept the interim uh, position. The board was polled and gave their their agreement. Once Tony's dis our profession. Pat, all of us thank you for being the chairman of this effort and uh, urge you to get us started in this important undertaking. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, David. You may have noticed that uh, it's not a short walk over here from the airport, so I have a hunch we'll have some folks drifting in uh, during the proceedings. I would urge us all to pretend they aren't there and just concentrate on, <clears throat> on what's before us. In preparing for this meeting, the task force on demonstrating professionalism took a look at the growth of interest in this subject throughout the history of our organization. And let me just share with you some milestones along the way. 1947, of course, saw the formation of PRSA by the merger of two pre-existing groups. The reason expressed, or at least one of the strong reasons expressed way back then in 1947, almost 40 years ago, was to bring some semblance of professionalism to what was a, an emerging and soon to be fast growing field. Only three years later, in 1950, PRSA adopted its first code of professional standards and in 1954 uh, upgraded them substantially to essentially the document that we know today, though it has been changed on occasion. In 1964, the society felt the need for something more. And so the counselor's section, as it was then known, began working on the idea of accreditation. When the Academy presented this idea to our governing assembly, however, the assembly felt it was such an important step that it should not be limited to the counselor section, but be open to all members. In 1974, shortly after a rancorous debate in Hawaii the year earlier on a dues increase, a somewhat familiar topic to those of us who've been in the society for a while, Issues emanating from that discussion led to the formation of a task force on access to professionalism. Note the word again, professionalism. The idea at that time was that corporations and the government in their wisdom had long had public relations professionals on staff 
And now the idea was starting to spill over into broader society so that a number of folks representing not-for-profit institutions whose pay at that time and budget at that time tended to be, be far smaller than the corporate or government budgets were now beginning to come into the field. And so the goal of that task force was to see how we could broaden the coverage of PRSA. And I guess I don't have to tell you today that representatives of schools, hospitals, colleges, uh, activist organizations, and others make up almost 40% of the membership of our society. Out of that task force came much of the present structure of the society, including the special interest sections, so that PRSA was able to discuss professionalism locally in the chapters, nationally through the code of professional standards and shared information, and then by the current industry, if I can use that term, in which each practitioner is practicing. A much broader thought of professionalism certainly than had existed in 1947 when PRSA was founded. In 1980, a Blue Ribbon Task Force on the Status and Role of Public Relations, chaired by one of today's presenters, issued a lengthy report based on some research and a good deal of thought by a number of very senior practitioners. This report dealt with issues that I wish we could say were resolved, but are not. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But an interesting thing occurred in 1980. All of the sister organizations who represent public relations professionals had for the first time come together formally in what is now the North American Public Relations Council. As a result of that, this Blue Ribbon Report in 1980 on our stature and role was joined by 13 other organizations beside PRSA. So now having gone from a, a founding group in 47 interested in professionalism, and then in the 70s having, bro having broadened out to encompass new types of institutions that were employing and retaining professionals, we had taken that additional step to try to bring together all of the organizations in the field beyond PRSA who are interested in the topic. The major point of discussion of that 1980 report, however, was the lack of a definition of our field. And so in 1983, when Joe Awad was our president, he blithely announced at the beginning of his year that before it was over, he would have us a neat little, I think he said, Jim, a sentence or two definition that we can all go out and tell people. Well, if you... Uh, followed the work of that committee, you know that it turned out not to be a sentence or two definition. But it did, I believe, turn out to be a single page paper which pretty clearly defines the breadth and the realm of what this field is about. And the effort again was a step to unite us in a sense of professionalism. And so now here we are in 1986, formally convening elected leaders of the society and others to begin to formalize the discussion that has been going on since 1947. The task before us, therefore, is nothing less than to try to bring to fruition ideas that are now 40 years old. Lest that awesome responsibility overcome us, I think we need to sharpen our focus of what we intend to do in our time together. And the task force would urge you to follow this approach. We all know things that won't work, and we're going to hear discussion of that because it's necessary. To say what won't work for discussion purposes is important, but when Sunday morning comes and we try to come to some agreement we hope the emphasis will be to find things that will work because clearly there's 40 years of history of people wanting to bring this subject to some kind of at least incipient resolution. So that if we find that the problem is indeed a common definition, that the work to date hasn't achieved that, then let us leave here with some ideas for a plan that will bring about that definition. If we find that it's the terminology that people are calling themselves other things besides public relations practitioners, then let us try and leave here with an assignment 
to some group to really put some resources and some energy into dealing with it and not just bemoaning the lack of a common terminology. If we find that it's education, then for heaven's sakes, let's help Jack Felton and next year's administration find ways to turn resources solidly into education so we can begin to do that job. Now, I've been in PRSA just long enough to know that if you have a position here, you can usually count on at least 42 other positions on the same subject. I think that's very healthy. I think, in fact, that is one of the marks of a profession, is that people are free to express their opinions and are intelligent, educated, capable of gathering the data that brings them to whatever their position is. I hope that these 42 other positions will come out on everything we discuss because my professional experience tells me that from this kind of, of friendly collegial disagreement comes the creativity that will indeed help us to leave this meeting with some positive steps to take. Let's keep it a sort of a family fight, if you will. We'll go at it like mad in here, but when we go out that door, lest anyone else say things haven't been done, lets us be able to say that they have. I hope we can avoid begging the question. There are two primary begs of this question. One is that, well, we, we really don't have a definition, and I don't think any of us would disagree with that. But for purposes of this meeting, the definition of public relations is the sheet, again shared with you in the mailings, that was devised in 1983. Now, one of the actions you may want to suggest is to change that, but for now, that's the definition of public relations. The other bag of the question is, well, it takes individual performance. Only individual performance will get us recognized as a profession. I think that does beg the question because it seems that the proper phrasing is, only individual performance will get each of us as individuals recognized as professionals, but somebody has to define the profession in which we work. How can indeed anyone even evaluate our performance if somewhere someone has not told them what we do, what we are capable of doing, and how we do it? So therefore, I hope we can concentrate on the real issues that are before us in this meeting. What are we after here? On Sunday morning, in addition to some positives, some things we can do, are we after consensus? Well, wouldn't that be lovely? But let's face it, we probably won't get it. Are we then after a sense of the meeting? I think we are. I think we are not particularly going to have majority and minority votes, though we'll probably have some numbers along the way that, that seem to be that. But it seems to me if we can leave here with a sense of the meeting that says that a majority of the people who attended feel that this is a subject that ought to be investigated or that the following action ought to be taken. And then, following good order, giving those who want to file a minority report the opportunity to do so, since we are, after all, not an action body, we're not the assembly, it seems to me that's probably the goal of this meeting. Let me just call two things to your attention. First, we sent everybody a sheet on responsibilities of invitees. I won't uh, play the father figure by reading it to you, but if you happen to have it along, you might want to read it yourself. Secondly, there are three subjects that the task force purposely did not put on the agenda. It's probably already clear from my previous remarks. One of them is the common designation, the terminology. This doesn't mean you can't talk about it, give us an action proposal, but you're not going to hear anything about it in the presentations and you didn't get a pink paper on it. Another one is the agreed body of knowledge. If you want to spend time discussing the body of knowledge, let's spend time saying that we ought to come to an agreed body. But I'm afraid if we start talking about the agreed body of knowledge, it'll have to be a three-week meeting at least and not a three-day meeting. You may be interested in knowing, however, that the Research Committee of PRSA and the Research Committee of one of our fellow 
societies are both now engaged